This is Bob Wilhite. Right. He is one of the founders at Adler. Yeah. He was one of my very first teachers. He taught me lifestyle. So uh, don't lay that out for me. <laughs> don't lay <don't laughs> <lay that>. it <laughs> He is now faculty emeritus. And he and his wife Jean both have taught at Adler, taught for at Adler for many years. And uh, he finally retired a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but he hasn't lost anything up here yet. Well, he yeah. still knows it all. Oh, so yeah. we love to have him come <laughs> and Don't share his. Me. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, he's very modest and shy. Yeah. But uh, as you probably know from your handout materials, he developed the Wilhite method of working with early recollections and dreams. <clears throat> so we asked him, since we have the man himself, to come tonight and to teach you how to do that method so that you can then go into your pairs and do it. So he's going to teach it. He's going to let you ask questions so you get real clear on how to do it. Mm -hmm. And then you will be going off to do it. The other thing I want to mention to you is that uh, Bob and Jean have a tremendous amount of social interest. They always have. And Bob and Jean have volunteered to be mentors to any student who would like to get help and interpreting early recollections after you've taken this class. So all you have to do is give them a call or you can go visit them. They live in New Hope, right? Yep. And he is the expert on early recollections and he was the one that taught me everything I know on early recollections so he can definitely help you. And uh, so don't hesitate take advantage of this wonderful opportunity. And it's free. Free. <laughs> that makes it even better. There's no charge for anybody. this. <laughs> okay? Right? If I can train you. You can train anybody. You got That's that. right. Okay, take it away, Bob. Thank you. Uh, just a short <laughs> word about how we started the Alfred Adler Institute of Minnesota. Uh, I was at Family and Children's Service, Chairman of Staff Development, and we invited Rudolph Rankins to speak. Now, I got my training at University of Nebraska as a Freudian. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, hey, this Rankins makes pretty good sense because he's doing tell him what I've been doing anyhow. See, I didn't, I don't want to go. So we went to Chicago. Bill Pugh, Mim Pugh's first husband. Uh, my wife and I went to Chicago uh, to George Diamond's Steakhouse and met and decided we're going to start an institute here. And now, this was what, 20 some years ago, 30? Well, anyhow, up to Get now, close to 40, Bob. They, Time flies when you're having fun. They finally <laughs> got it right. <laughs> finally got it right. And I asked Riker, I said, well, who do we teach? He said, whoever walks in the door. <laughs> Fortunately, he could not be selected. <laughs> Now, uh, how did I invent, invent the Wilhite method? After I, well, well I got stuck <laughs> with a client, and I couldn't figure out what the devil she was talking about. So I, I took the recollection and broke it down, and that got into the feelings in that recollection. And then I began to work with that. I didn't name this as egotistical as it would sound. <laughs> I was making a presentation at a national conference in New York City, and some New Jersey people 
saw it and we liked that. So the next year I went to, I think it was Vancouver or yeah, someplace, and I ran into this couple and they said, hey, we've been doing wheel heights on a lot of people. I said, what? <laughs> we've been doing wheel heights. I said, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> And they said, well, we took a method and used it in group psychotherapy, and that's how it got it to. So what I'm going to do tonight is to teach you how the method works and a systematic process whereby it works. And first I'm going to tell you a to uh, a Tina and Oli joke. <laughs> you like Tina and Oli joke? Oli was sneaking out of the house and Tina said, Oli, get back in here. So he goes back in. She said, Oli, come up to the bedroom. Okay. He said, now Oli, take off my dress. So he did. Oli, take off my panties and bra. So he did. And Tina said, now, next time you want to go into town, wear your own clothes. <laughs> 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 got to think about that. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> I first came across Adler in 1948. Don't tell me how long ago that was. But I was a senior in college. I was writing a paper on the concept personality and soul. Soul. And I needed to find a psychoanalytical approach on the description of soul. You know how many psychoanalysts wrote on that? Alfred Adler. So I went to the bookstore and the guy said, I got just a book for you. I said, who's this Adler character? You gotta be kidding. So that's my first brush with Adler. And the first page of your handout is really what we're gonna work with tonight. And Adler said, in an individual we see the feelings have grown and developed in a direction and to a level that were essential to the attainment of his or her personal goal. Uh, goal. goal directed behavior. Um, so what I, what I change that to is my statement next. Feelings and emotions are developed to bring about behavior that will move in a direction and to the degree that is essential to the attainment of his or her personal goal. Now, as you collect data in the lifestyle instrument, you begin to uh, gain impressions about the client and about his or her goal and what he or she is up to. And we are taught, I hope, to watch movement. Have you ever heard that? Oh, they've heard that one, I see. <laughs> we look for movement, in other words, the behavior that this person deals with to develops to get to whatever the goal is. Now we're going to do that. However, something missing. 
And I figured the thing that is missing is the feelings that bring, bring about the behavior that sends a person toward his or her particular goal. Feelings and emotions. We were asking for that. We're going to do that. Now what I'm going to do is work on uh, the process and see if I can get this thing to work. Hello, Al! <laughs> what do I do? Get over to the recollections and dreams. Here? Yep. All right. Double click. They, he, ta he taught me how to do this. Now, it's working. And uh, he, he uses the slow method of. <laughs> Come on, Al. Quit thinking on me. Yeah. Now, the reason I put that up there, when I retired, I moved to Arkansas. And if I walked into a room of students and said, my name is Robert Will Hyde, and I'm, they wouldn't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> you say, howdy, I'm Bob, and here we go. <laughs> oh. Now, the Wilhite method of early recollection analysis goes a step further in the process to have the client identify specific feelings and emotions. <clears throat> no. In order to significantly change behavior patterns, he or she needs to use a different set of emotions our feeling responses. Now, what, what we've done in the past is, go ahead, dummy, change your behavior and you'll be okay. And they keep the same feelings and guess what happens? They fall back into the same whole behavior. And I want to demonstrate that. Right. What happens here? There we go. It is crucial that in taking the data, we let the client express himself in their own words in order that the biased perception can be identified. Now, if, if you had ever sat in my class, one of the things you get scolded for is to get messed up and middle in the process before you need to. Stay out of it. Adler and Dreikers says, if you want to know something about a client, ask them. <clears throat> okay, so we ask them, and as they start to explain it, we get into interpretation and you do this, shut up. <laughs> Wait until you understand what is happening. Because a certain client, you can identify this for me, will do whatever you suggest. Mm -hmm. What client is that? Pleaser. A pleaser. Hey, they all get aged today. <laughs> a pleaser will say, yeah, what do you want what what do you want me to say? Don't ever answer that question. Don't ever answer that question. You want to know what's coming from them and what their perception is. Okay. Anger or rage shows up as a primary process. Treat the emotion as a problem. What I'm trying to do here is any behavior or emotional response that causes a, a problem, then, then you need to deal with it. Anger is appropriate. I might get a little angry, but they're hot there. 
I've gotten angry at Sue before. A couple times. <laughs> Didn't do any good, but I, I did. But any kind of feeling or emotion that produces uh, problem behaviors, that's an issue. If you get a hand out. I'll get it. They're eight dollars and sixty cents. <laughs> yeah. So that's what we're getting into. What? Push the wrong button now. Heather Crow. If you choose to change the literary content, if you choose not to, you can bully yourself to change behavior by sheer willpower. Now, what if you're given a recollection and this tells you a story about the behavior of the individual and uh, uh, the, the outcome? And you say, okay, this is your recollection. How would you change it? And they would say, I wouldn't. No, I didn't. What's your answer? Quick guess. They're not going to change. I choose to stay the way I am, but I came in here for you to fix me. I ain't gonna fix you, there's the door. Well, you can't do that, why? I paid you. <coughs> you paid me to help you deal with behavior issues, which means you're going to change behavior. And I'll show you in my uh, presentation how that uh, Sometimes it happens, they get stuck. Oh, uh, the word fantasy. How many of you believe fantasy is a good thing? And how many of you believe fantasy is a bad thing? Yeah, fantasy. You go nuts if you fantasize, right? All right, listen up very carefully. You cannot fantasize anything that is not consistent with your private logic. Hmm. Hello there. Now we can do that. <laughs> now, how many believe in fantasy? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> You cannot fantasize anything about your life that's not consistent with your private view of the world. So I, when I went, went around talking about fantasizing, people started laughing at me and I said, I'm going to show you how it works. Now, <coughs> Now, in your handout is a memory example. And here we go. You can make all the notes you want. Now, let me give you a little history on this. This was not taken yesterday. I took this memory from a lady in overtime at a a uh, public presentation of that learning theory. She volunteered to come up. This was 32 years ago. <clears throat> so this isn't fresh material. I mean, it's been laying around for a while. <laughs> but I picked it for a reason. And that's right. I had to walk to school. I was the youngest. School was straight across the vacant lot from my house. Mom made me walk with my older 
brother and sister. We were never to cut across the field. One day coming home from school, I decided to leave my brother and sister and cut across the field. Halfway across, <coughs> I stepped on a hive of bees. They stung me. I ran home screaming in pain. As I got close to the house, I saw my mother waiting for me. She grabbed me and spanked me. I was hurt and angry. And the standout when I asked for her was seeing my mother waiting for me. Now, tell me about her. What's she like? Start at the top. <clears throat> I had to walk to school. I was the youngest. What does that tell you about her perception of self? How many of you are the youngest? All right. Tell me what that's like. What is she saying there? Well, she was, um, she probably felt that you need to be protected by your older brother and sister. The, you older children can t tell me this is, sorry. Are you the older? No. Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you want to be protected, what else? Someone, uh, someone should have taken care of her? Something, take care of her, what else? That's good. So her perception is that she is in a position that she should be taken care of. All right? And she describes the school across the street from the baby. And here's the next line again. Mom made me walk with my older brother and sister. Now, if she wants to be protected and taken care of, what's her problem that mom made her walk with protective device? What's that line in there for? She didn't feel like mom believed in her. She felt yeah. Maybe she, incapable or something. She wanted, um, even though someone should take care of her, she wants independence. Right. She's going to amplify her position in life, and even though I'm the youngest and should be taken care of, I don't want to trick it out. I'll be able to handle myself. But there it is. We were never to cut across the field. Guess what she's going to do? One day, coming across from school, I decided to leave my brother and sister and cut across the field. Halfway across, I stepped on a hive of bees. They stung me. Well, what does this say about her? Life is... Painful. Life is dangerous. Life is a problem out there. And uh, <clears throat> you, you, you can get in trouble. So I start screaming in pain and run for the house. And I saw my mother waiting for me. What do you think she's looking for? Take care of me. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Protect me, Mom. I got stung. But she grabbed me and spanked me. Now, oh, what does that say? Me and my mom, no. Mm -hmm. What does that say? Lack of trust. Huh? Not able to trust? Yeah. You broke the rules. Unfair. Why is it unfair? That's not what I look for. I wasn't there at all. 
Well, you can make all of these guesses, which you did, and I told you not to do it. <laughs> but you will anyhow in your head. Now, if you really want to find out what this lady is up to, we will start back at the beginning and take it a line or a phrase at a time and see what she says. Now this is what you're going to do in your exercise when you leave here. And here's what I want to do is, is take this and see what she says. Now, let's take it away. There we go. Oops. I didn't have the seam in my mouth. Yeah. First phrase is, I had to walk to school. She starts right off, feeling sorry for myself. I was the youngest. Small, but that makes sense, doesn't it? The school was straight across the vacant lot. Her response to that was curious. Now, therapeutically, <clears throat> what's going to happen to her when she gets curious? Well, we'll never find out. <laughs> Mom made me walk with my older brother and sister. Frustration. Did any of you ever get frustrated? No. What do you, yeah. <laughs> if you come up here, you'll get frustrated. You know? yeah. What do you do when you get frustrated? Where is your sense of direction? You're not too sure. <laughs> kind of out there wondering what's going on. All right. And bring up another phrase here. There we go. We were never to cut across the field. Now here is a direct uh, commandment, or a direct order from the boss, mom. And how does she respond? Uneasy. You're supposed to say, yes, ma'am. Well, she doesn't do that. One day coming home from school, I decided to leave my brother and sister and cut across the field. Anticipation and excitement. Now here, she is deliberately disobeying the instruction, knowing full well what she is not supposed to do. And her feeling is <coughs> anticipation and excitement. Mm -hmm. But not only that, too quick. Halfway across the field, I step on a hive of bees. Gutsy. That's stupid. <laughs> I should have told her right then and there, you can't feel that way, right? That's what she put there. So as you're analyzing the recollection you have from your um, partner, whatever they put down there is their perception of how things are going. Remember, what you're doing in this process <clears throat> is taking the recollection and saying, what's the feeling sequence that you go through to get to the conclusion? And they say, what? They all know this method allows you to take it step by step 
and and uh, find out how they respond. What happens, and this happens once in a while, if they say no feeling? Come on, Edwards, tell me what that means. No feeling. I have no feeling response to that phrase whatsoever. You're hiding something. Denial, whatever you want to call it. But as if it happens in the process, write that down and then later on come back to it and find out really what feeling is in there. Eventually it will come up. That made sense? Am I right? Always. You're good. Always. Okay. You're good. <clears throat> they stung me. Now, there's not only pain, but there is extreme pain. Once in a while, when you go through a memory, pain, extreme pain, excruciating pain, or so well, or pain, pain, pain. And you might say, well, that's a whole one. No, it's the client's way of telling you to what degree that emotion is there. So don't, go ahead and put them in there. Because that's what they're telling you in the process. I ran home because of the pain that hurt. As I got close to the house, I saw my mother waiting for me. Now here's what you were talking about before in terms of what she assumed or anticipates uh, her need uh, to be fulfilled. Anticipation and relief. You're going to get taken care of, right? I then put that up there. She grabbed me and spanked me. Bummer. <laughs> <laughs> Shock. Painful. Now what do you know about her? <coughs> I've been told not to do something. But out of my gutsiness, I take a risk to do it anyhow. And if I get myself in trouble and there are painful consequences, I should be taken care of. And by golly, I'm not. And she's telling you right there. And it ends up, she feels, He feels <laughs> hurt and angry. Why? She didn't get what she wanted. Her expectations were not fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Who is she angry at? We don't know yet. And the standout is seeing my mother waiting for me, and look where she winds up in the conclusion of the recollection. <clears throat> How do you put that together? How do you put that together? I want sympathy, but I'm going to remain small. For what purpose does she remain small? To be taken care of? Hmm? To be taken care of? Yeah. That's the only way I know to be taken care of. 
my perception in life is that I am, if I'm small, I have to be taken care of regardless of how gutsy I behave. Right? Now, would you have believed she would come up with these feelings if she went through that? I didn't. I thought, so, well, all right. Let's see what you do with it. But I got the information by listening to the presentation. As you read a line or a phrase, the client will stop you and say, well, I feel this on this feeling or uh, uh, halfway through, uh, sorry or small or whatever. At this stage of the game, you have listened to every response the client has given you. You do not have an investment in any of it so far. You have made it possible for the data to be prepared so then, then you can use it as a treatment in uh, instrument as long as you stay out of it. The minute you get in there, you're part of it. You know that's hard to do. We're trained to figure out, oh, I got an idea about that. I'm going to tell you right now, and I'll jump in there. No, 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 no. Stay out. Now I'm going to show you how you can get into it. Any questions so far? I've talked. Yes, ma'am. Do you take whatever feeling words they give you, or do you help them really to? I give them a feeling sheet. Okay. You got them? Oh. Yep. Oh, the Two? feeling list? Yeah. Yep. The feeling list. You've the feeling got one list. Of your binders. No. Your hand up. So small. Feel, when she said small, that would have, like, I would have thought, oh, is that oh, really an emotion? Is that a feeling? I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> now, on the feeling list that, that's given to you here, there's two or three examples of them. And that is a, a cheat list, right? Right? A cheat list? No, come on. <clears throat> You cannot pick out a feeling in a feeling list that's not consistent with your private logic. <laughs> How many times did I say that? Say it again. One more. One more you can add? Make sure they get that, yeah. Whatever you pick <laughs> off of the feeling list still has to be consistent with your private view of the world. Now, I've seen feeling lists with 35 responses, 50 responses, one I think it was 104. I would not use that one because it's too confusing. And it's not. But uh, to further answer your question, if they falter or stumble, what happens to the response if you finally make suggestions? Now, if you give them two or three suggestions, they'll have to pick one. Maybe that is the selection. But I prefer to stay out of it as much as I can. Do you feel that <clears throat> Or have maybe you've actually experienced that actually entering in and realizing you're entering into it and pulling back out. Do you feel like the client will correct you if you've actually given a suggestion and they doesn't fit their private logic? Will they correct you? Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, they, they're not going to agree with you yeah. just because, are they? Most of the time. Pleaser, pleaser. Yeah. 
Yes. I, I have a question. I know it will come up. Um, yeah. Earlier there, when she stepped on the bees, yeah. she said the emotion was hurt. Yeah. So that was a physical pain, mm -hmm. and she's giving a, a right. feeling of hurt. Right. So is she describing the physical pain, or is she describing the emotion? Both. Both. So is that I, question I think she, lot? and if you're not sure, ask it. Which, which is, well, anybody would feel hurt if you stuck on the bees. Well, what you step on in the first place for? <laughs> and you don't know unless you ask. And sometimes the answer you get, you don't know whether it's a physical or a fact or whether it is. Uh, and that's why sometimes you have to kind of dig into it a little bit. Find out. But only after the point you got this stuff done. Now, I said, all right, you don't like life the way it is? How would you like to change it? She answered properly, and I don't know. Well, that's right. I said, all right, one way to help you decide how to change it we're going to take the same material, go back over it, and you can change it any way you want. You can change the recollection, you can change the feeling, <coughs> whatever. If you change the data, I would assume you would change the feeling. If you change the data, and keep the feeling, what's going to happen? Okay. You're going to do the same behavior. That's what this is all about. So, now, I don't know what I got here. Oh, all right. No, let's look at that. Look at the feelings you get. And no, you, any questions about that as you look at that? And now you have your analytical hat on. What do you know about it? It shows up in the sequence, forget the recollection, in the feeling sequence, how she sets herself up. Right? Are you sure? All right, tell me. Come on, you said yeah. This is how you she just put, set yourself up? What? what? This is how she kind of progresses through life. She goes through these where she'll feel sorry for herself, she'll get curious about something, and just That's right. how she moves through it. This one recollection will give you a very good clue of how she perceives life to be. You're right. And she will go through this cycle in some form or another as she uh, deals with life's issues. Right down the line. This is her. In fact, when I get this up on my blackboard, and there it is, I ask, does this look like somebody you know? And they say, yeah. Now, one time somebody said, well, that really is me. I said, then who the hell is it? <laughs> It is that person. That is what they're telling you. Now, how do you think she's going to change this? Let's find out. You got the ER revised. And I got them up here. I was able to walk to school by myself. 
How? That's different from what feeling sorry for myself. Isn't that a pretty good deal? I thought that, I, I think it was going all right. All right. So you actually asked her, the next step is actually to say, now let's rewrite it, or do you want yeah. to rewrite it? Uh, or revise it? I, I read that phrase, I was able to walk to school for myself, and that's the phrase, and she can change it if she wanted to. But she didn't. Well, you made that up and suggested it, and then no. she... I read the recollection back. Oh, read the recollection back. Okay. I read the recollection back. A phrase at the time. I read back her data and gave her the option Option. to keep it or change it. Ma'am. There, there's a difference in a conversation you, you and I had yeah. between asking them how they'd like to change it and what outcome would you like to have? Because well, when you ask what outcome you'd like to have, they, okay. I don't want the outcome. The outcome don't come down here. Mm -hmm. I want to take it a step at a time as she builds up the locomotive to get to the outcome. Mm -hmm. So we're saying similar, but I want to get it in process. But the difference there. And she could have said, uh, I took a bus to school. All right, how did that feel? But she didn't say that. She said, instead of saying I had to walk to school, she said I was able to walk to That's how she said it. All right, what's she gonna do with I was a youngest? I was the youngest. Small. I said, oh, what? whoa, wait a minute here. You gonna keep that? Yep. Are you sure you're gonna keep Yep. Why in the world would she wanna keep that? She's small, she'll be taken care of. That's right. She's got to be done, sure, she's taken, taken care of. Had she changed the fact that she was the youngest to gutsy, as she said before, uh uh, I'm small. And the school was straight across. From a vacant lot. Curious? Curious. What about that one? Is that okay to keep that? She's going to her anyhow. Mm -hmm. Now, curiosity is not a bad thing. <clears throat> it is not necessarily a good thing. It is a neutral thing until you find out where it gets you. I want all my curiosity get me in big trouble up at Northridge, which is a senior reti or retirement residential. And the reason it gets me in big trouble is that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> and I usually find it. Okay, curiosity. Now, oh, you just missed one. All right, we'll go back. Is that it? Yeah. I had to go through the whole thing. No, just go through the whole thing. Down to the... Let's be with it. Yeah, I was going to say, what did you say? 
That's the new thing. Yeah. All right. It's not that curious. Four was mom told my older brother and sister I could handle myself just fine. Now here's the line she changed. Why? This gets her out of the position you're talking about, that these two turkeys are supposed to take care of her. No, she said. Mom said I could handle myself just fine. What is she up to? Independence. Independence. I can handle things just fine as long as you see to it that it works out my way. <laughs> oh, hello there. Because <laughs> handling things just fine is my way, right? <clears throat> and every one of you in the room do the same thing, right? Now, there's a difference between I want things my way and my way or the highway. Two different. Right? Now you wouldn't do that. But we all want things to develop in the direction and to the degree that fulfills our expectations, right? Because that's our private logic. And when it doesn't, you kind of find a way to get around there and make it okay. But that's not happening. I was told there was a cut across the field. One day, coming home from school, I decided to cut across the field. Anticipation and excitement. Now this is where her curiosity is building up. I can get that going pretty good. Okay. Yeah. I decided to leave my brother and sister and cut across the field. Gutsy, right? Yeah. That is. Halfway across, I stepped on a hive of bees. And here's where I really stopped. I said, now oh, wait a minute. This is a reconstruction. You can write this thing any way you want. Now, this is a fact. This is what happened. She looked me straight in the eye and said, I want the bees. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Do I say that dumb? Sick, mad, stupid, <laughs> crazy, what? Oh, she wants the bees. I couldn't change her mind. Should I have tried to? Why? This tells you where she is. I was shocked. I thought she'd take a stick and beat the heck out of that behind. No, I didn't know what she'd do. I want the bees. <laughs> All right, lady, you can have the beach. <laughs> now we'll find out what happens to it. But don't be surprised as you go through the process what your client is going to tell you. They stung me. Again, I, now wait a minute, this is a, a rewrite. <coughs> Pad yourself with red, uh, uh, wet mud, and they won't. Oh, they stung me. Extreme pain. I ran home screaming in pain. Hurt. As I got close to the house, 
I saw my mother waiting for me. Anticipation, relief. What's she looking for? Comfort. What's she looking for? Now before, in the old thing, she grabbed me and spanked me. But they always changed it. She grabbed me and hugged me. Safe and secure. And the standout, where'd it go, Al? Well, that it is. He held me real cold and comforted me. Warm and cared for it. And the standout, oh, I got it back up. She comforted me, cared for it. No, in the rewrite of the recollection, where did she wind up? Where she wanted to be. Grown up, cared for. How did she get there? The only way she perceived herself to get into a position to feel warm and cared for is to get hurt. So, She's gutsy, she walks across the field, she steps on the bees, she gets stung. Then and only then does she get what she wants. All right? <coughs> step one, you've just seen step one in therapy. Believe that? You better, I just said so. <laughs> <laughs> because step one in therapy tells you in what direction she is willing to make changes. And already you said, oh, come on, we're going to get rid of all this a lot. You say, yeah, that's all right. Here's your 100 bucks or go home. She is telling you to, uh, what direction she's going to change. Now you know. Now, Sue, I'm going to throw a ringer into this. Given this data, what is your treatment plan? What is your treatment plan with this client? No, I'm asking that. I'm going to put them on the spot. You know yeah, what? A, so. Do they know what the treatment plan is? Uh, actually, let's see. How many in this class have taken basic counseling? Well, let me ask it another way. <clears throat> As you approach this situation physically, what are you going to do? This is a treatment plan for her. <laughs> As you approach her to do some uh, therapeutic intervention, what are you going to do? Well, if you set that like that, she's not going to do anything. Would you maybe try to um, pull out the times when she has been cared for but not to get hurt first? You could do that, yeah. What else? What are you going to do about her perception of being small? Buy her a mirror? Huh? <laughs> Anything. What are you going to do? 
go well, three times when she's low. been big. I don't know. Go three times when she's been taking care of herself. Yeah. First of all, you're going to challenge her perception. A smile means that she puts herself in a position for others' control or take care of her or care for her. Okay? That's one position. What else? Therapeutically, what are you going to do with this? One thing I would like to tell her is you don't have to stop on a damn swarm of bees to get cared for. You don't need that. You know what her answer would be? Yes, I do. No, you don't. <laughs> Could it be, you don't like it. Could it be there's another way to be cared for? to have someone love you, to be helped. Well, I don't know. And she doesn't know. I would challenge that. And the other thing you would challenge? How about, would challenging, add, huh? how about challenging her view that um, there are repercussions that she has to, that are going to follow normally? If you decide to get gutsy. Oh, that was the gutsy one. And go against the flow. What are the consequences? I don't know. But you see, all these things are in there given a condition and given the emotion and feelings connected to it. Do you talk at all about unconditional love? You know, a parent yeah. to a child? Yeah. What being loved like in this family? <clears throat> yeah. How does she define her worth? Yeah. Hmm. That the whole system, finding your sense of worth and value as a person. Okay, so you see, now you're in a position to do all kinds of options, but you know what her perception is of what you're going to have to deal with. And behavior will not change unless there is a corresponding feeling position that goes with it. Otherwise, they will go right back into the same thing. And my experience in doing this, if I go back over it and revise it and revamp it, if they go down the first three or four feeling sequences and don't change it, but change something down at the bottom, there's a big ice cream uh, cart down there waiting for me and I'm going to change that and I can have all the ice cream I want. It's not going to change her behavior. Any idea why? Once she starts going through the sequence of the first three or four steps, she's going to go the whole route. And so I said, all right, I'll give you the ice cream cart down there, but let's get back up here where you start to get in trouble. Now, you know how to do it, don't you? What? No. What? When you do the revisit, yeah. Do you literally do it one sentence? Ask them if they want to change it, then ask for a feeling, and then do the second sentence. Yeah. I never know how far to read 
in the recollection. Mm -hmm. But the client would tell me, if they want to split up a sentence out, the first part I felt this is the second part. And so don't go too fast as you read it back, but give them a chance because the more instances of emotions and feelings you get, you get a picture of the sequential buildup. Much part of work. Again, let the client tell you. If this recollection is fairly short, mm -hmm. have you had clients with really long, drawn out recollections that you still go line by line, just many sessions? The answer to that is yes. What happened was, I do all kinds of crazy things. A guy came in and said, I got tr a trouble with this particular situation that I, I got into him yesterday. I said, all right, tell it to me. Now this is not necessarily like I have this recollection. But this is what he went through. And it was about 35, 40. I said, no, we've done the recollection before. I'm going to go back over and do this. <clears throat> and the same pattern showed up somewhere in there. Has to. It is his or her logic. What? would you say if it isn't? This is weird. <laughs> you blow my theory completely. It has nothing to do with the conclusions we reached and the analysis of the recollection. What does that mean? is still telling me another part of the life. I don't know how it fits now, but there's something out there that you still do, but this is you. It's got to fit. Now, what's the first thing you're going to say to your partner when you go off and you do. Well, I said, <laughs> what's the first thing you're going to say? Give me a recollection. <laughs> Why do we deal with this? <clears throat> I don't know who counted this up. And I, I really don't want to know. But we used to take a statement of, of the first five years of your life. And my uh, little speech was, in the first four or five years of life, we have something like 25 to 30,000 hours of waking time where things can happen. We only choose to remember vividly those instances that are consistent with our private lot. I don't know who counted up to 25 or 30,000 hours. I don't care. Everything is entered in our brain cells, and we pick and choose from that. Now, dream analysis is done the same way. You take down the dream and write the feeling upon awakening, and then you go back and pick up the feelings. Adler said, our dreams, our vehicles, whereby our feelings and emotions are expressed. And we never pick up on that. 
don't know. You heard the story about the guy who had a dream where he's walking home late at night and he heard these footsteps behind him. You know a dream like this? Mm. And as he walked faster, the footsteps walked faster. And he turned around to see what it was. And it was a casket chasing. Oh, this is weird. Oh, he nuts. A coffin right there. So he ran and the coffin ran. And he ran into his house, slammed the door. The coffin comes right through the door. So he runs upstairs to the bathroom, opens a medicine chest, and grabs the only thing that's in there, a bottle of Robitussin. And he threw it. And the Robitussin Stop the coffin. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> you don't believe that, do you? <laughs> I was ready to write down the analysis of that. Right. <clears throat> so, how would you analyze that one? <laughs> I read it in Reader's Digest. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that is a typical being chased dream, right? And what does that mean? Life is dangerous, precarious. What? A race. Yeah. And if I dare slow up, it'll get me. What is a fallen dream? Falling dream? Falling dream. A falling dream? No I had a guy in Omaha who gave me a dream. I climbed up to the third floor, looked over the edge, and fell. And just before I hit the ground, I spread my arm and flew oh. away. What? What? Analyze that. Perfect control. Perfect what? Control. Perfect control. I can handle it. And I told him, he said, no, I'm not through with it. Said, what do you mean? He said, I go back in the building, I go up to the third floor, I go, fall off the edge, I, before I hit the ground, I fly. I said, you just told me that. And he said, I did it again. All right. I said, uh, this is really the height of you being able to handle situations. Now oh, that's it. No, oh, he said, I'm not done yet. <laughs> and then I, I got up, went up to the floor, and fell over the edge. On the way down, I thought, what's the worst thing that could happen to me if I hit the ground? So I did. I thought, this guy is nuts. He said, I got up and brushed myself off and felt fine. Analyze it. Don't mind you, Anthony, analyze it. He has, he's kind of okay to fail. Pardon? It's okay to fail. It's okay to fail. Ah, oh, no, by the way. It's not okay to fail. I can go through experience after experience and control life as dangerous as it may be, but should I hit the ground 
I will still survive. He said, you're right. So you see how he was taken. I never heard one like that before. <laughs> I want that one. You like that one? That's my dream now. <laughs> and if we had time, which we don't, I have a stuck section here. I want to ask you a question. Yeah. Does the feeling sequence that you get how, what does that have to do with what's the problems they're dealing with in their life right now? Because the feelings that you bring up are, uh, go along with the behavior that you develop. And are they the same as what was in here? Are the, oh. are the feelings that they're bringing up in their current situation the same as the ones in here? In their recollection. Unless you change them. You will go. What I'm saying is, in the pattern, as it builds up, feeling sorry for herself, small, curious, and frustrated, she's going to go right into it for blast. Something in the beginning has to change to deal with a different perception. Of life. And if you don't change it, <coughs> back you go. Can she use that new perception in dealing with the current problems? Yep. And a new, <coughs> new perception says, well, maybe I can survive without being bailed out or without presenting myself as small and inadequate. And she didn't use inadequate. But as long as I perceive myself as inadequate, what am I going to do when I walk into a challenging situation? I'm going to be done sure I fail. So if I keep that perception of small and inadequate, no matter what task you give me, I will screw it up big time. Because my perception is I can't do it. I am living out my private logic. However, if I decide the best way to get through this class is bully my way and you better back off, no matter what, to what degree or problem I get into, look out. You cannot defeat me. Why? Because my perception says, I will win. You can beat the hell out of me and pull me all over the floor. And I get up and say, heck, I'm not dead yet. So you, you, you live out that perception. The, the client or patient comes to you because of a problem issue in their life. So you begin to work that into that problem issue. And as long as they continue the old behavior with the same feeling sequence, they will continue repeating that problem. A lot of clients will come in and say, you change all those people out there, I'll be fine. <laughs> and that ain't gonna happen. I need to work on the perception of self. And you will find this all the way through the lifestyle instrument. This data should coincide with the birth order, attributes, 
Pojedin se tu, ovaj dan ovaj, et skratite biti in sestati. And I know it is because I help develop that one. So don't mess it up. It helps you. Uh, some people will start with the recollections. Some people will start with the attribute scale. Some people will start with birth order. I don't care where you start. It's all there to help you get a picture of what this life is about. But once you get all that done, then you'll be as good as Sue and Catholic. Right? Right. Questions? Come on, you haven't stopped me yet and skipped with us. I'm old and retired. Take advantage of it. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned in your writings that some people will will say they felt one way during their recollection and they might feel differently in the present time? No. And you said to record both? No. When you come across a, a fact response as you're going through the recollection identity, just leave it there and come back to it and begin to fish, dig, find out there's a feeling or emotion behind that that they're not dealing with. So Bob, if they said it's a sunny, it was a sunny day, yeah, and they say that's a fact. That's right. What are you gonna do with that? Well, how do you feel about a sunny day? Very simple. The kiss methods, right? What? Kiss methods. Keep it simple, stupid. Yeah, I have a question about um, early recollections yeah. that are um, that have abuse in them. Abuse, when, yeah. abuse when they're yeah. when they're giving you an early recollection, right. it has to right. do with some type of abuse when they're a child. And obviously, you want to rewrite it so that you're empowering them. Yes. But does that emotion sequence or the the feeling sequence? Is that what, are they falling into that again? I mean, what, yeah. is there with, another step in there? With, with abuse and abusive situations, many times those feeling responses are so submerged, they don't want to look at them. And it, it, you may not get it the first time or two. You begin to work with them. But you realize something is down there that they don't want to look at or uh, reveal, because they're hiding it big time. Well, a lot of times, you know, with the abuse ones, it's everything that's going on, and then they would want to change the ending, you know, how that happens. Yeah. So do you let them, when it's that type of thing, just change the ending and just slowly work that way? Working with it and trying to get it down as you can, Go ahead, let them change the ending, and then come back and see how can we get there. Okay. You know, anyway, what Adelian do, I'm sure Sue has taught you this, is to use the swag method. The what? Swag. S-W-A-G. That's a scientific wild ass guess. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't put it quite that way. Oh, but that, that's what we do. We make, no, we make guesses out of our perception of the situation based on our clinical knowledge. Now you can't make a wild ass guess that's irresponsible. You still gotta be consistent. That's the old could it be? Yeah, that's right. I just want to throw that <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Okay.
Okay, now you.